It is now time for our special monthly panel discussion. We're going to talk about modern crime fighting techniques, and we're going to talk about how they harmonize with the principles of a free society. And you're invited to participate and join us with our three panelists. And we will start with our first panelist, Richard Mack. He is an author, speaker, and former Arizona sheriff. He was named elected official of the year by the Arizona New Mexico Coalition of Counties in 1994, received the NRA Law Officer of the Year, was inducted into the NRA Hall of Fame, was the recipient of the 1995 Cicero Award, Samuel Adams Leadership Award from the Local Sovereignty Coalition, and Gun Owners of America Defender of the Second Amendment Award. Richard and six other sheriffs from across the United States challenged the constitutionality of the mandatory background check Brady Bill. They fought it all the way to the United States Supreme Court, where they won a monumental decision for freedom. He is the author of The County Sheriff, America's Last Hope, From My Cold Dead Fingers, and The Proper Role of Law Enforcement. Let's welcome to the Global Freedom Report our first panelist, Sheriff Richard Mack. Richard, how are you? Doing really well. Uh, can you hear me okay? I hear you real well. You started out working with the Provo, Utah Police Department some 20 plus years ago. How would you characterize the differences between working for the police and working for the sheriff's office? Well, that, that is an excellent question, and people ask that all the time. Uh, primarily, the, the difference is, is that the chief of police has a restricted jurisdiction within the city limits of the, of the city wherein he uh, is the chief, and um, the sheriff has countywide jurisdiction, but the unique thing about a sheriff is he runs a jail. He also serves papers for the courts. He usually provides security for courts. And he also has uh, criminal investigation authority and arrest authority throughout the county, although there are some states in the east that are trying to reduce the power of the sheriff and get the sheriff to where he is only a security officer and a paper server. Uh, that is not the case uh, in the west or the midwest or the south along the Bible Belt. That only exists in uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island and Pennsylvania. And the sheriff is the only elected law enforcement officer in the country, and therein lies the true power of the sheriff, because he answers directly to the power source, to the people. And in America, we the people possess all political power. We bestow the power upon the president. We bestow the power upon the governor and the state legislature. We bestow the power upon the sheriff, and he is the ultimate protector and the last line in the sand for the people. The most important thing that your sheriff or chief or any other peace officer can do in this country is to keep his off oath of office to uphold and defend the Constitution. Every peace officer, every government official, must swear an oath required by the Constitution. That is a constitutional requirement in Article 6, last paragraph. We are all required by the supreme law of the land to swear an oath of allegiance to the Constitution. And that's the most important thing we can do is the fulfillment of our oath. Great. Thank you, and thanks for being with us, Richard. Annie Paradise has been working with Berkeley Cop Watch for over a year. She comes from a background of advocacy research focusing on extrajudicial killings and gendered and state violence in Indian-occupied Kashmir, including an internship with Human Rights Watch. At Berkeley Cop Watch, she works on police accountability projects, including research, writing, and collective resistance and coalition building. Berkeley Cop Watch sees a growing trend of civilian monitoring by police as a dangerous threat to civil liberties and freedom. Annie also works with other members to support initiatives against police misconduct and abuse across California and will be part of the upcoming summer campaign against ordinances targeting people without homes in Berkeley. Annie Paradise. Welcome to the Global Freedom Report. Ani, are you there? Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Um, in addition to your work with Berkeley Cop Watch, you're a member of the California Coalition for Women Prisoners, and you regularly visit prisons. And I'm, I'm curious, how does it feel to spend so much time in such an environment as a prison? And does your work with women prisoners help you with your work at Berkeley Cop Watch? Yes. Uh, with the California Coalition for Women Prisoners, we visit women in the uh, two of the largest 
state prison, two of the largest women's prisons uh, up in Chowchilla, California. Some of the women that we visit are uh, serving life sentences for crimes that they committed as juveniles, um, and they're sentenced to life without parole. It's an issue that we're actually working on right now to get um, legislation that would uh, give these women a second chance to have their uh, to come before a board and have their crimes reviewed. Uh, so we're organizing around SB9 in California right now. Um, in terms of going in and spending time in the prisons, I think it does give you uh, a sense of uh, the criminal justice system as something that links the courts, the police, um, and the actual physical building where people are incarcerated. Um, so, yeah, going through, you know, going into the prisons and having to show your identification to get in, um, the restrictions that the women are placed on there, uh, and the way that their crimes are dealt with gives you an idea of how this, this, this society basically is um, monitoring people, imprisoning people, and using the prisons as a way to threaten people who are in society and not incarcerated. Excellent. Thank you, Annie. Ani, excuse me. Ani, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Our third panelist, Jack Cole, is executive director of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. He retired as a detective lieutenant after a 26-year career with the New Jersey State Police. For 12 of those years, he worked as an undercover narcotics officer. Jack has spoken on drug policy reform in the European Parliament and to groups in Australia, Canada, Central America, Europe, New Zealand, and across the United States. Jack is passionate in his belief that the drug war is needlessly destroying the lives of young people and corrupting our police. Jack was the recipient of the H.B. Spear Award for Achievement in the Field of Control and Enforcement at the 2005 Biannual International Drug Police Alliance Conference in Long Beach, California. The significance of that award is that it is given to those involved in law enforcement who demonstrate a balanced regard for the needs of enforcement and those of human compassion. Let's welcome our third panelist, Jack Toll. Welcome to the Global Freedom Report. Thank you. It's uh, good to be here. Jack, you spent a couple of years undercover posing as a drug dealer wanted for murder while tracking members of a criminal organization. What was that like? Did you have to live the role of drug dealer 24 hours a day, or was it like a part-timer where you can go home on weekends and spend time with your wife and family? In two years, I was home 13 days. Well, what was it like to live that way? I mean, you are, you know, you're basically wanted for murder. Well, it's not much fun, but it's uh, even less fun for the people whose lives you're uh, impacting. And... Uh, when when somebody when you befriend somebody and that's that's the role of an undercover agent in every case uh, is to become someone's closest friend their their best confidant so that you can betray them and send them to jail and I did that over and over again about a thousand young people went to jail as a direct result of what I did in uh, drug work when yeah, right. when uh, you become someone's friend and they invite you into your home it's like inviting a viper inside you know. Uh, for, there, there are no rights. There is no constitutional uh, coverage whatsoever for that. We, we search out whatever we can to uh, find uh, anything that we can uh, uh, apply to these people, apply pressure to them, so that they'll give up all their friends and relatives. I'll tell you, it's a it's lifestyle. Not a nice job, is it's what a, I'm trying. It's to. a lifestyle most of us really don't appreciate. Uh, we really don't understand, though. So many of us think we do. Even though you're all from the United States, my questions on today's topic can easily be applied anywhere else in the world. I think most people would agree that fighting crime is good for a society. The areas in which we may disagree involve the methods used and tactics employed in pursuit of this goal. Are they worth the result? And that's what we intend to explore over the next 90 minutes or so. Now, my first question for each of you, is what are the proper roles, the proper role, for sheriffs, deputies, and police officers in a free society? Richard, let's start with you. Well, the proper role is to follow the Constitution, and it's okay for us to keep the rules as we go after criminals. Uh, I was also an undercover narcotics officer, and after I finished is when I started questioning what we do in law enforcement. 
uh, not only as Jack uh, alluded to, is it uh, an unethical system, but uh, a lot of what we do, it, we have like 700,000 peace officers in this country who are hell-bent to find out what we have in our pockets and our chest of drawers and our glove compartments. Uh, and I, I just wonder if, if that's really helping and the mentality that it's creating among law enforcement. Uh, I do not agree with roadblocks. I do not agree with DUI checkpoints. I do not agree that uh, peace officers in this country should be stopping everybody and checking on their papers before they're allowed to go from point A to point B. Uh, I believe that's a clear violation of, of the Fourth Amendment and probably some others. Uh, yet the Supreme Court has endorsed that, so the police agencies of this country are just going to do it because the Supreme Court said they could. I question that as a leadership uh, role uh, with all chiefs of police and sheriffs in this country. Don't we have an obligation to know and understand enough about American ideals that we know that roadblocks are akin to uh, Gestapo Germany and it's, it's stopping people, just stopping people uh, at random or stopping everybody and checking on their papers? Doesn't that strike everybody just a little bit wrong? Well, and that's the thing. Even as you describe it, that's the image that goes, I know, through my mind and probably through many people, you know, all those uh, World War II movies and everything. That's what comes to mind as you're talking about stopping people, checking their papers and all that. Ani, Ani, how would you respond to the question? What are the proper roles for sheriff's deputies and police officers? Uh, I think... One of the things that we're looking at at Berkeley Cop Watch is what are the effects of escalating police presence uh, in communities as well as the legislation that's empowering them to uh, violate people's rights uh, more consistently and more insidiously. I think uh, a lot of the organizations or, or uh, struggles that we're working with here in the Bay Area are really looking at what it would mean for communities themselves to start to define what security would mean for them and how they would work together to, uh, I guess, reimagine, in reimagining security, also reimagine what's been labeled crime in this society, um, which, you know, just the definitions of crime itself have a long history in this country that uh, aren't necessarily um, definitions that we all agree on. That's uh, that's a great comment, actually. I, I don't think people look at that very often, and they should. Now, we, we hear the word crime, and we respond to it. But there is crime, and there is crime. The word itself is very vague, and we tend not to define it the way we ought to. So thank you for that. Um, Jack, how would you respond to the initial question? What are the proper roles for sheriffs, deputies, and police officers in a free society? Well, I felt very bad about my role in implementing what today I've decided is not only a failed drug war, but it's far worse. It's a uh, self-perpetuating and constantly expanding policy disaster. Every year it's worse than the year before. So when I retired, I sat down with four other police officers, and we created Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, or LEAP. Uh, we, we tried to figure out. The answer to that very question, when we boiled it down to the essence, what we decided that law enforcement should be interested in is reducing four things, death, disease, crime, and addiction. And sadly, all four of those categories are made just infinitely worse by the war on drugs, so that definitely wasn't what we wanted. What we do want is reflected in our name. We want to end drug prohibition in this country, just like we ended alcohol prohibition in 1933, because looking at this from the viewpoint of law enforcement, we understand that the day after we ended that terrible law, Al Capone and all his smuggling buddies were out of business. They were off our streets. They were no longer out there killing each other to control that very lucrative market. They were no longer killing us police officers charged with fighting that useless war. And they were no longer killing our children caught in crossfire and drive-by shooting. So we know that if we legalize these drugs, we can end this violence. And then when we regulate those drugs, we can do some other wonderful things. We can virtually end overdose deaths because people don't die of a drug overdose because they shoot more and more dope. They die because they don't know how much of that tiny package of powder they're, they're taking is really uh, the drug and how much the cutting agent. If you, if you know what you're taking, you don't die of an overdose. 
Ani, if you were hiring, you're actually going to make the decision. What qualities would you be looking for in police officer or sheriff's deputy candidates? And do you believe that most modern police officers and deputy sheriffs display those qualities that you would look for? Uh, thank you. Um, again, I would go back to the idea that um, communities have the have the right to decide on who they want to be in positions uh, that determine their own issues around uh, security. I think um, I think that uh, to go back to, I was really interested in a lot of the things that Mr. Cole or Jack was saying um, in looking at, you know, what it is that we're even policing uh, when we're hiring these people. I think if you go back to things like um, prohibition and Jack, I've been reading the Wickersham reports, uh, which really you can see how a whole understanding of crime and what's being policed and how departments uh, locally are responding to that uh, really look a lot different at one time. And also simultaneously, um, was structured around an idea of prohibition, which is now similar to the way that um, that drugs are the drug war is being waged. But in terms of what qualities, I really think that that would depend on holding meetings together as a community, determining what it is that um, that community sees as violations of its safety, and um, taking it from there. Now, okay, now that's fair. Now. Richard, you actually were in that position. You were the sheriff, which means basically you did the hiring for the deputies and su of the deputies and such. Yes. What qualities do you look for when you're um, talking to candidates for a position of that sort? And do you believe most police and deputies today display those qualities? Um, the, to answer the second half, no. And to get to the first half, <laughs> uh, I want to hire somebody who's compassionate. Uh, I think that feeds over into Ani's category, but uh, I want an officer uh, who's who's honest, and that's an easy one to say, but I mean somebody who's really honest, who when they swear an oath that they actually keep their word and that the fundamentals of American ideals mean something to this, these people. And I'll put that into this uh, category. It's just as important to them, to this type of an officer, that he determines that someone might be innocent as well as guilty. And too many times we see officers get these blinders on and, and they have the suspect and they're going to do anything and everything to get this guy and they'll cut corners and they'll enforce stupid laws. I want somebody who's able to think, who knows what America is and who know, is able to recognize when we have gone too far. And I'll compare that to the Rosa Park story. Any any horrible incident, any catastrophe that has happened within law enforcement ranks in this country, including the arrest of Rosa Parks for failure to give up her seat to a white man, yes, that was a statutory law in Alabama, and the officers felt obliged to enforce it because it was on the books. I want somebody smart enough and patriotic enough to know that that was wrong and that it shouldn't have happened and that we shouldn't be doing this to uh, people today. And it might be a different, it might be a different issue, but it's still uh, human rights that we're talking about. And I want officers who can throw away the book and explain that the most important thing we can do is protect people's rights. When, when you were with the Arizona sheriff, did you find officers of that sort for your deputies? Every now and again, but it wasn't nearly as much. And I certainly tried to train them in those duties. And um, I'm meeting more and more that are getting on board with this. And, and I think organizations like LEAP, uh, I certainly have been a member of LEAP and have been on their Speakers Bureau. I believe in that. But I hope that everybody realizes that the Constitution is not a cafeteria. You don't get to walk, walk through and pick what you want and leave the rest. Uh, freedom is something that you have to take all of it. And, and so I, I, I really believe that uh, both keepers and others like that have really made a huge impact on affecting the way we view law enforcement today.
And, and what you say is true. There's no such thing as being partially free. It's like right. being partially pregnant. It right. just doesn't work that way. Jack, do you differentiate between the terms peace officer and law enforcement officer? And if so, how do they differ? Jack? They differ tremendously. Uh, uh, here we talk about law enforcement officers. You know, in, in the United Kingdom, we have a lot of members over there. And they, they get quite a kick out of talking about, uh, what is this law enforcement people? Over there, they're peace officers. And the reason they feel that way is, uh, their, their uh, policing was started by the father of modern policing, Robert Peel, who in 1829 wrote nine principles for police, policing that if we abided by today, we would have a much better system. And his ninth rule, is the test of police efficiency is the absence of crime and disorder and not the visible evidence of police action in dealing with them. But what that means is we should not be crediting police for uh, the number of arrests they make necessarily, but for the fact that they're solving problems before it comes to a point where they need to arrest people. Uh, arrests have become a literally a numbers game, especially in this war on drugs. Uh, our police officers get promoted and get choice jobs by the number of arrests they make, and uh, we need to look at things besides arrests. You know, I spent 26 years in the New Jersey State Police, and I can't remember a single time that anybody, any supervisor, ever went to hear uh, a, a person on their staff testify to make sure that they were telling the truth and that they were uh, giving uh, the the subjects that we're dealing with uh, their rights. We don't judge police by the number of convictions they get. We judge them by the number of arrests they get, which means uh, they'll go out and make any kind of arrest, some of them. Not I, I think that, that's a tremendous... That, some of them do this. That, that's an absolutely tremendous point. That's like uh, I think it's China. It's either China or Japan. I think it's China, where the doctor is only paid, okay, when you are not sick. When you get sick, the doctor doesn't get paid, and he has incentive, therefore, to make you well, because only then does he get paid. Same type of thing. You're basically saying that the role of these people ought to be to be not noticed rather than to be noticed. We we, we know you're doing a good job by the absence of any incident. That's a great That's point. That's right. And, and, and the war on drugs is, is the diametrically opposed to community policing. Community policing is what you're talking about, as, as I, and at least what I believe is the good picture of what policing should be. We have a couple of comments, uh, actually a comment and a question from the chat room. The comment, in Salt Lake City, this is from El Jefe, in Salt Lake City, the Sheriff's Department is a corporation and not an elected position like most of the country, a very scary prospect. Um, Richard, well, you're, you're from up that way. Uh, is that true? First of all, it's not true. What they did is they consolidated the sheriff's office with the uh, police department there in Salt Lake City. Uh, the sheriff is still elected, uh, but regrettably, the sheriff there doesn't know his constitutional duty to serve the people, and, and now they, they have kind of brought the sheriff underneath this incorporated umbrella uh, within Salt Lake City. It was just a move to uh, save money, uh, very similar to what Las Vegas Metro did. Las Vegas Metro is really a combination of Las Vegas PD and Clark County Sheriff's Office. And uh, the, head, the head of Metro is uh, the sheriff, Sheriff Gillespie, in, in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, it should save money, uh, but the sheriff... Uh, has got to remain accountable, not to the city com council or to the county commissioners, uh, and that has gone on with the Salt Lake City deal a little bit when the sheriff agreed to do this. Um, it, it is a consolidation that could help financially, but as far as uh, having the sheriff remain answerable to the people, uh, it has uh, definitely caused a problem there. Well, and that's a perfect, a perfect lead-in to the question being asked by Deputy Donut in the chat room. And anybody is who'd like to answer this, go right ahead. Um, somebody asked the guests if they would be if they would be in favor of abandoning the metro police departments 
and going only with an elected sheriff instead? Well, I'll answer that real quickly, and I say yes, that's the way it should be. Uh, it's the police departments that are not accountable uh, to the people that I think is very problematic. Uh, certainly, uh, Jack and Ani know that there are other problems besides that, but you want the sheriff directly responsible to the people, not a bureaucracy, not a bureaucrat, and you don't want the, sh- the law enforcement officials becoming bureaucrat. You want them answerable and responsible to the people. Let me ask Jack your opinion on that same question, just because you, uh, um, Richard has been both police and sheriff, but you're, you've been police. Would you be in favor of the idea of abandoning Metro Police and just going to simple elected sheriff? No, I wouldn't. Uh, I, I think there's too much chance of uh, uh, certainly an honorable person is going to be uh, uh, accountable to to the electorate, but there's a lot of dishonorable people out there that will be accountable to the people that put them in office, that, that give them the money to run. Now, tiebreaker tie for, for you, Ani. What are your thoughts you? on that? You're, you're neither police nor sheriff in terms of your leanings. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, get rid of Metro PDs all over the country and just go to county sheriffs, elected sheriffs, or not? Um, I think one of the um, one of the architects of the Berkeley, the current Berkeley Police Department, goes back to a man named August Bulmer. Um, and one of the uh, he was he was a, an architect of the Berkeley Police as it as it is today. And one of the things that he, as I understand it, um, attempted to do was to, to some extent, take the, uh, the, the police department out of the hands of sort of the politicians, uh, in a way to reduce corruption. Um, I think, uh, I think that if I think that probably what would be good is to have uh, review boards for uh, uh, police where, you know, the police actions were accountable through some sort of community review board. We had uh, a review board like this, and we actually still have it in place in Berkeley, but it's become rather uh, rather toothless. Um, but review boards that have the power to um, – possibly discipline officers as well or recommend disciplinary action as well as actually hear um, what the complaints are against officers and find out sort of, I guess, greater transparency, I think, would be um, how I would approach uh, accountability on the part of police and sheriffs. Our topic is modern crime fighting techniques and their impact on personal freedom. Our guests are Sheriff Richard Mack, author, um, one of the most one of the most well-known freedom patriot activists in my lifetime, and it's a pleasure to have him with us. Uh, we also have Jack Cole, Executive Director of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, LEAP, and we also have Ani Paradise from Berkeley Top Watch. and together we're trying to sift through what's really going on in terms of crime fighting. And you know, we've already had a couple of good points brought up between the distinction between law enforcement and peace officer. One of the things I wanted to throw into the mix is law enforcement. It always, it always, I found it curious when I would see the word force in the midst of it. Law enforcement. And there was something very unpeaceful about that approach. Now, it's my position that whether it's police, sheriffs, deputies, All of these people are the product of their training. That's why there is such um, consistency, it seems, between how they will behave, because they've all been trained to do certain things. Over the last 10 to 20 years, how has training changed, and how has that affected the general attitudes of police officers and or sheriff's deputies? Richard, start with you. Well, I think uh, one of the things it's it's a paramilitary structure, so they're they're you know they're trained in academies. To, yes, sir, no, sir, and, and do all the physical fitness requirements, and uh, it's just too militaristic for me. 
Uh, and there's very little training in uh, the Constitution, uh, the oath of office, uh, police ethics. Uh, and the most ethical thing we can do in law enforcement is to make sure we're following the Constitution, make sure we're following the oath of office. Uh, I think it's an, a, a, an outrage that we in law enforcement and in all government take oaths that we completely ignore as soon as we take them. Uh, and that's part of training. That's part of leadership. And, and it's too much of a them against us mentality. And the, these, all these uh, videotapes of officer beatings and officer misconduct uh, very much has me uh, wondering what's going on when there isn't someone with a, a videotape going or a camcorder going or a cell phone uh, recording these abuses. And, and all of these things come back to training and to leadership. Uh, and I, I think it's a huge indictment against uh, the police community nationwide. Yes, we need to concentrate on being peace officers. And I really love what Jack said about number nine uh, in the UK is being we the numbers game he's talking about uh, is absolute dead on target. And that's what really uh, caused me to be disgruntled uh, at the Provo Police Department. It was all based on numbers, especially ticket writing. And to me, ticket writing is nothing but taxation through citation. And that's what I've called it in my book. And I've had a book called, as you mentioned, uh, The Proper Role of Law Enforcement. And I think we've missed the boat big time. And all this numbers game and this numbers nonsense has taken officers away from being protect and serve and actual public servants to tax masters, revenue collectors, and um, even worse, uh, abusing the public. And, and a comment from the chat room, right on the money. They will keep on with their brutality because they have no reason to stop. They have no incentive. Nobody calls them on their stuff. It's just part of the standard procedure. Um, how about you, Jack? 10, 20 years going back in time, uh, how has training changed? And how has that affected the general attitudes of police officers? First, let me say that uh, I absolutely agree with every single word that Richard said in his last statement. Every word. Thanks. Uh, this is something very near and dear to my my life. I let me take a minute or two to tell you about how I got into this in the first place. I joined the New Jersey State Police in 1964. That was the height of the civil rights uh, demonstration era. And uh, I was uh, 26 years old. I was married, had two kids, a little bit old to be a cop. Uh, I was watching television one night, and for about the thousandth time, I was seeing newsreels of of police feeding men, women, and children for nothing other than the fact that they wanted their rights as human beings. And I was particularly moved that night, and I told my wife, I can't, uh, I can't watch another one of these programs unless I think of something to do about this. And after much thinking, it occurred to me that if people that felt like I do would join these organizations, we might be able to change them from the inside, because certainly no one was changing them from the outside. Let me, let me, now segue to this war on drugs again, because the war on drugs has arguably been the single most devastating, dysfunctional social uh, policy since slavery. And the reason I say that is uh, it is so imbalanced, people we are arresting out there for these drug violations. And, you know, I joined the New Jersey State Police. The New Jersey State Police... Uh, if for anybody that reads the newspapers uh, uh, can understand that that we are one of the most racially and gender biased organizations around uh, if we didn't create racial profiling we certainly raised it to a high art form and then when we really got uh, good at it we brought in all our best racial profilers from the toll roads and the interstates, uh, and we brought them down to division headquarters and created one organization out of them, one unit called the Interdiction Unit. And now to get to, to training, thanks to the funding from DEA's Operation Pipeline, 
this one unit went to 41 different states in the United States teaching police officers everywhere to do what we did, which history has proven was absolutely blatant racial, racial profiling. And the results of this racial profiling is this. If you look at, if you want to know who uses and sells drugs in the United States, very easy to find out. If you look at the Federal Household Survey, and it says 72% of those folks look just like me, a bunch of white guys. Only 13.5% of those folks are black. But now who gets arrested? 37% of all the people arrested for drug violations in this country are black. Who goes to prison? 60% of all those in state prisons serving drug felonies are black. 81% of our federal prisoners for drug violations are 81%. They're only 13% of the problem. Blacks are now serving an average of six years in prison for exactly the same drug crimes that whites are serving an average of four years in prison for. That sure, that sure sounds like racial profiling to me, i got to say. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, let me just say one more thing about it, because this next thing I think is just devastating. When you look at the number of people per 100,000 population we imprison in this country, <clears throat> it's huge. It's, it's larger than any other country in the world, the number of people we imprison. But, and that's bad enough. But when you break this down by race and gender, it just gets mind-boggling. We imprison white men at the rate of 943,000, or 943 per 100,000 in this country. Before I tell you how many black men we imprison here, let me suggest to you that under the most racist governmental regime in modern history, the apartheid government of South Africa, in 1993, the year before they fell, they imprisoned black men at the rate of 851 per 100,000. But in the United States, in the year 2008, under this prohibition government we have, we imprison black men at the rate of 6,667 per 100,000. Now, how anybody could look at that one stat and not see institutionalized racism in the implementation of these laws, I don't know. No, I, there's no question it could be seen. The question is whether they care enough to do anything about it when they do see it. And we just had a caller. The caller just dropped off. If you call back again, we'll get you on the air. Ani, do you believe that modern crime-fighting techniques, tactics, and protocols represent an attack on personal freedom and individual rights? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I do. Um, in terms of uh, uh, in in terms of um, I'm, I'm still thinking into Jack's uh, last question and just wanted to bring up a, a book by M Michelle Alexander that just came out um, called The New Jim Crow. And one of the, the arguments that she asserts in that book is that uh, she says there's more African-Americans in the U.S. right now who are under some form of penal supervision, whether that's uh, incarceration or probation, um, than there were under slavery. Uh, and I think, you know, in California alone, we have 160,000 people uh, who are incarcerated currently. So it's, it's absolutely mind-boggling the number of people that um, are imprisoned and uh, the, the obvious... Um, uh, racial bias of people in prison that I'm really pleased to hear uh, drawn attention to and see it as an issue. Um, in terms of do modern crime fighting, what was the, can you repeat the question? Well, whether or no. not you think that modern crime fighting tech tactics and techniques represent an attack on personal freedom and individual rights. Yeah, and I mean, I think one of the things um, that we're looking at a lot right now in, in Berkeley Cop Watch and uh, with uh, many groups in San Francisco is um, how crime fighting techniques have changed to be uh, to, to a greater emphasis on intelligence led policing and on surveillance um, uh, of particular communities. And for us, I mean, before the break, you were speaking about um linking uh, policing to militarization, I think one of the things that we're seeing a lot of at rallies and at protests is an obvious visual uh, militarization of the police, whether that's um, militarized formations or uh, 
uh, you know, increased armaments, um, different vehicles that come out, uh, that kind of thing. But one of the things that we're also seeing as, uh, as linked to militarization is, is this hyper surveillance, um, that's coming through as local agencies continue to work with, um, national agencies. So for instance, we had, um, at the Oscar Grant was a young man who was uh, killed by police officers in a BART station uh, uh, two years ago out here. And when, uh, as people were organizing around uh, that issue and trying to make sure that the, the cop was held accountable, uh, for the protest, the number of people, uh, the number of different agencies that were actually uh, working together prior to the upcoming rallies, whether that was around the issue of the verdict or the issue of the sentencing for the cop, uh, the number of agencies that were working together and actually re- doing surveillance on groups that were organizing locally uh, was absolutely astounding. You know, so we had the Drug Enforcement Administration, the Federal Bureau, Bureau of Investigation, FBI, obviously, Secret Service, um, California Department of Justice, as well as uh, all of these local agencies working together, um, SWAT teams from different uh, from different areas in California, or uh, the Highway Patrol working with um, police departments outside of uh, Oakland, where the where the rallies were happening. So I think one of the things is looking at this kind of um, consolidation that's occurring, or this centralization as government agencies, particularly the FBI, is working with um, local groups. Uh, or excuse me, working with local law enforcement, whether, you know, through formations like the Joint Terrorism Task Forces. All right. Um, we only have about a minute or so on this before the break, but Richard, how do you respond to the same question? Modern crime-fighting techniques and tactics, uh, are they an attack on personal freedom and individual liberty? Well, it's it's all part. The technology certainly has allowed, certainly has allowed uh, officers and detectives to, be much more invasive into our private lives and privacy. Uh, there hardly is any privacy anymore, and especially with the Patriot Act, uh, a lot of this is allowed. And, in fact, um, the Patriot Act allows officers to write their own warrants and to serve uh, them. And that's exactly what we wanted to stop in 1775 um, when we first started as a country. And we've come full circle now, and officers believing that that's okay really makes me wonder, because I know politicians are going to go wrong, but I certainly think officers would not. Let's take a break from our questions and find out a little bit about what some of our panelists or what our panelists are doing these days. Sheriff Richard Mack, author of The County Sheriff, America's Last Hope, From My Cold Dead Fingers and the Proper Role of Law Enforcement. You know, those are the, those are timeless pieces. You know, even though you wrote My Cold Dead Fingers quite a number of years ago, it's a timeless piece. Do you find people are still interested? Yeah, it's still doing quite well. Um, uh, it's not in bookstores, but uh, my Internet website is uh, still very active with that book. Uh, the, the biggest one, uh, the biggest seller, the one that's moving the most is The County Sheriff of America's Last Hope because I actually wrote it as a state sovereignty issue and a state nullification issue and have connected the dots as to why local officials, not just the sheriffs, but chiefs of police, uh, county commissioners, city council, school boards, governors, state legislators, uh, should all be standing against the incursions of the federal government. And the Supreme Court decision that I won back when I was sheriff, and Sheriff Prince and I ended up at the Supreme Court together on this issue, two small-town sheriffs beat the Clinton administration uh, and have a landmark decision to boot. Uh, to go along with it, to prove that the federal government is not our boss. The federal government cannot tell us what to do, and we have acquiesced and allowed this. The states and counties and cities have actually allowed this so that they could uh, participate in all the federal grants and funding that the federal government gets. And the, the first state that uh, realizes that uh, the enslaving uh, federal government financial situation that we've been accustomed to uh, needs to stop. And the first state that stops that will be the richest and most uh, prolific uh, state in the history of our country. Oh, I think that's true. Uh, it, I'm curious whether the county sheriff, America's Last Hope, whether you find that there are a lot of sheriffs out there or deputies or, or people in government who have read it, or is it mostly people like me 
who just love freedom and want to know how things are supposed to be. Well, no, we've got it to every sheriff in the country, and um, that that's really where it's targeted. But every citizen needs to read it. It's something that we have to do together. Right. Uh, but, yes, uh, a lot of sheriffs are waking up. We have two sheriffs right now in Oregon who are standing against the United States Forest Service. And yeah, it's a, let's hear it for Oregon. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I'll tell you, it's Sheriff Gilbertson and Sheriff Palmer and Grant Cap and Josephine County. And, and, and it, it's going good. And, by the way, that website is www.sheriffmack, M-A-C-K, sheriffmack.com. I would, I would just add one other thing. I have a little booklet called the, the Victory for State Sovereignty, and it's a synopsis of my case. And it's only like a $2 booklet. You can order a bunch and get them less than a dollar. But it's it fits right into your pocket, and it's the most powerful tool I think I have because it lets people know what the Supreme Court actually said about our case and actually um, a ruling from the United States Supreme Court that proves that we are not subject to federal direction. And uh, you can see how impotent the federal government was actually supposed to be. And, Richard, are you going to be appearing anywhere? I know you do speaking engagements all the time. Yeah, I just did four in Ohio. Uh, I've got some coming up. Just keep um, check the keep website. Tuned in, keep tuned into my website because it'll say all of them there. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. I actually had to. I actually had to cancel this one. Uh, one this weekend in Missouri, and I really tried hard not to. Uh, but when you're uh, having uh, a funeral in the family, and the funeral is your mother, it's hard to make those arrangements. I wasn't going to mention it, but since you have, allow me to express my sincere condolences, and I know the listeners are on the same page with me on that. Thank you so much. Uh, and, it was a surprise, and, and uh, she's, she was quite a lady. And it, it, it's also a remarkable statement of character that while going through all of this, you still find the time and the energy to do this show, and we all thank you because we're all getting a lot out of it. Thanks so much, Richard. You're welcome. Ani Paradise. With Berkeley Cop Watch. Now, um, what activities is Berkeley Cop Watch engaged in right now? What do you want to promote for the organization? What do you want the listeners to know most about the organization? Thank you. Uh, so Berkeley Cop Watch does, our, we have three central uh, activities that we do. We do direct monitoring shifts, um, which is going out in the community um, and with video cameras, with notebooks, just keeping an eye on what's going on at these stops um, and, and uh, basically watching the community and handing out cards about the kinds of things that we do. Um, we also do know your rights trainings uh, regularly for both, you know, we do a lot with high school groups, um, but also whoever wants to come to the grassroots house in Berkeley and uh, learn their rights so that they won't be abused by the police. We, uh, we have a website I'd like to direct people to where they can get a copy of These Streets Are Watching, which is a video that we've put together. Um, the website is just berkeleycopwatch.org. We also have a blog there where we keep uh, people updated about what's going on in, uh, in the world of, of policing and law enforcement. Our main goal at Berkeley Cop Watch is to empower people to watch the police and to form, um, uh, to take community responsibility for what's going on in their communities. Some of the actions that we're involved in uh, really quickly, because we also work in coalitions, uh, we're organizing this summer against sit-lie ordinances in Berkeley, which are um, essentially uh, quality of life policing, sort of nuisance laws, where homeless people are, uh, are being targeted. These laws have just gone, gone in in San Francisco. There's been a group out here that's been doing prolific organizing to stop the gang injunctions that are coming in uh, to Oakland. Uh, and uh, the next hearing, basically the gang injunctions are a legal justification for police harassment. Uh, and the next hearing and an important hearing for that is coming up in Oakland on May 17th. Also on the 18th, uh, we'll be going to San Francisco uh, the Asian Law Caucus, together with other groups, has really been looking at the way Arab Americans are being targeted uh, in recent, uh, recently in a post-9/11 context. Um, and this will be looking at the uh, the ways that the FBI and the SFPD have been working together to conduct uh, investigations or quote-unquote assessments. 
Um, however, if you're interested in starting a cop watch or working with us, please write to us at Berkeley Cop Watch, uh, Berkeley Cop Watch at Yahoo.com. We answer, Excellent. we answer emails. And, uh, one last thing that we've been doing a lot of work around is state by state attacks on people who have been observing the police and, um, the repression that's going on on a state by state level for direct monitoring. And, and by so the much. way, Shrithan, you said that you work with high school groups. Do you work with youth groups in general, not necessarily high school? Yeah, for sure. We work with, uh, there's tons of youth that, that it, stop it, it by just, the house. It seems, yep. to, it seems to me that the youth of, of America, it would be a great thing to, um, you know, get them involved in keeping an eye on public officials. It would be a win-win as far as I can see. So I'm glad to hear that. Jack Cole. From LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, um, what activities does LEAP have going on right now? Are there any events or any activities that are planned that we should know about? Well, you can go to our website, uh, and you can find it at copsaylegaliseddrugs.com, and there's a place on there that will tell you. We have so many things going. Sometimes we have 13 things going on the same day, 13, 14. Uh, in the last five days, I, I talked in New York State, uh, in Augusta, Maine, in uh, Hartford, uh, this morning I was down in Hartford, Connecticut, and actually uh, a little housekeeping thing. I'm no longer the executive director. I was the executive director of Leap for eight years, and uh, it got to be a bit much for me because I'd like to write a book myself, and I was working about 80 hours a week. I've done some. 1,200 and about 50 uh, presentations in the last eight years around the world. So we have a new executive director, a wonderful guy, a guy named uh, Neil Franklin. He's a retired major of the Maryland State Police. And anybody who'd like to meet him, uh, I would suggest that you go to something that's really apropos for this particular pro program. All the, all the, your listeners have to do is go to their computer and type in Google 10 rules for dealing with police. And when it comes up, there's a lot of hits on it, but usually the top hit is uh, for the Cato Institute, Cato at Liberty dot org. Uh, they have this movie, 10 Rules for De Dealing with Police, which was created by a group called the Flex Your Rights and who did it uh, working with some of our elite people. For instance, uh, the person that narrates it is a uh, former judge, Billy Murphy, who's a, uh, a speaker for us now down in, uh, in Maryland. And it's a wonderful thing to see. And you'll not only see the whole movie there, but you also hear uh, a presentation from our executive director, Neil, Neil and you also hear... Uh, Billy Murphy speaking about the Constitution, and it's really worth hearing. All right, and uh, Jack's website, Leap's website, www.leap.cc. Yeah, or copsaylegaliseddrugs.com will get you there, too. Copsaylegaliseddrugs.com will get us there, too. Okay. And we have callers on the line. I, he hasn't called back. Let's take Lee. Lee is calling in from Texas. Hi, Lee. Welcome to the show. You're on with Richard Mack, Jack Cole, and Ani Paradise. Hello, Brent, and thank you for bringing together this absolutely superb group of human beings who are speaking on such a sensitive but needed topic. Here is my question to um, a general question, and you might take it up later if they can't answer right now, Brent. Um, but, you know, seeing all of these YouTubes and seeing people who are being brutalized, knowing that the police are being trained to think of us, the citizen, as a criminal, every single one of us is branded as a criminal, what recourse do we have to protect ourselves from those who have taken a, an oath to protect us and have become our, the aggressor and the actual criminal in many cases. Where do we go? Who wants to tackle that? I'll take a shot at it. Uh, going back to this drug war again, you know, there's 97 million people in this country who admit to having used marijuana. Now, by law, 
those people are all criminals, and this includes uh, folks like three presidents, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, and Barack Obama. And all I can say about the, the enforcement end of this is, thank goodness we haven't managed to arrest and uh, uh, indict and imprison all these people that are committing these crimes. Thank goodness we haven't done that. Because if we if we ever did, we'd only have two kinds of people in this country. We'd have the people that are in prison and the people who are guarding those people. And I just sure don't want to live like that. Well, uh, can anybody else want to chime in on that? Well, I have to I'll have to counter on that on Jack. Uh, I think a lot more politicians should be in prison. <laughs> But uh, they're the ones that have made this uh, ridiculous law. They're the ones that created the drug war. They're the ones that uh, think prohibition can work some now. They're the ones that completely violate the principle of what, let's see, was it Ben Franklin who said, if you, lear- if you refuse to learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. We, we think that there's something magical now about what we're trying to do, that, that uh, prohibition somehow magically works today when it didn't work in, in the 1920s. It, it's absurd, uh, and yes, I put a lot of blame on, on politicians, but it's also the best way uh, to answer Lee's question is we've got to have leadership in this country, in law enforcement, uh, within the, the sheriffs and chiefs of police in this country that know and understand what America is supposed to be and that we continue to warehouse people, uh, and especially as Jack alluded to, uh, along racial lines that is way out of proportion, uh, and why we don't have uh, NAACP and other groups that are really going crazy over these issues and other groups that, that support the drug war, politicians who support the drug war and yet uh, say that we should not be uh, racially motivated in this country, we shouldn't be racist. Well, then look at your own policies, for God's sakes, and let's get these people out of these ridiculous prisons. And I'll also add the IRS prisons and the debtors prisons and the, the absolutely absurdity that we continue to support this kind of corrupt government. Uh, and it, it continues uh, just about within every Washington, D.C. bureaucracy, but these politicians continue to support it. And what hurts me even worse and scares me even more is that the people of this country continue to vote these people into office. Here is a question from the chat room, Lucas Rose. How has unionization affected problems with police behavior? Well, that's, you know, we've seen that uh, recently, the teachers union in Wisconsin and others. But, yeah, police unions, um, they have a little bit uh, more difficult time, though, um, it, it, it's against the law for police to go on strike in most places. So collective bargaining certainly happens, but uh, they, they can't go on strike so easily. And the blue flu is something that uh, police officers have used in the past. But um, uh, the unions have had a tremendous impact uh, and not a good one uh, on the economy. Uh, they continue to have government pay them. Uh, what a, a lot of times in a lot of places, what uh, the people simply can't afford and the tax base can't afford. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, I, I did support higher wages for police uh, back when I first started and when I was sheriff. Uh, my deputies were underpaid. And, and now, you know, nationwide, the salary for police is a lot more respectable. But I do not believe that that's uh, uh, a badge of honor to to and on the unions. All right, we have... Let me, let me, let me, let me, yeah. Uh, uh, the police unions also have a tremendous lobbying power, which is, you know, I'd like to go back to these questions, uh, if I can, because I, we wanted to answer that here at Berkeley Cop Watch as well, which is that we believe that people have the responsibility to... Um, to pressure uh, lawmakers to rescind laws that we don't rescind laws that we don't uh, agree with that or that are uh, you know targeting people unfairly. Uh, I think that people should keep themselves you know keep themselves informed through alternate news services. Um, but in terms of only working through allowing sort of leaders or higher up surveillance bodies to govern uh, the police and hold them accountable. We actually would shift that back to how do you empower the community to watch the police and take responsibility for uh, 
for you know ma- watching the police for, for yeah making sure that they're they're watching. Yeah, who who watches the watchers is essentially what you're saying. We have a call okay. from Deputy Donut who has been trying to get in, and I'm so glad you finally got in. Deputy Donut, welcome to the show. You're on the air. Hey, I gotta wake up first. Ah, hello everybody. This is Deputy. I do. We hear you Donut. fine. Out in the wild of West Texas here. Uh, I got just about three things I'd like to put out real quick if I can get it out. The first one is about uh, sheriffs versus this Metro Police. Y'all were talking about that a while back. I threw it out in the chat. Uh, y'all need to, to really look into that. Uh, as long as you've got appointed people running as chief of police and, and things of this nature, they're only accountable to whoever appointed them. They're not accountable to the people. At least these cops need to be, be accountable to the folks. Otherwise, this is never going to stop. This brutality, this nonsense, this thieving. I, I see it every day. Okay? Uh, so whoever was, was, was agreeing with me on that, hooray for you. Who, who, is that Matt? Go on. Go on, Deputy. Well, okay. Yeah. Second one. The, the lady there, Ani. I, I said it right. Yeah. Paradise. Uh, Thank you. Lord. We're going back, way back in the first part of this review, I guess. But uh, review boards, heck, from what I see, review boards accomplish nothing. You go up before, before some, some appointed chief of police with your recommendations for what they need to do with officer so-and-so, and he don't have to do anything. We see this every day, too. They look at it and say, no, nope, we're not going to do that. And he stays on the payroll and keeps right on doing what he was doing. got to be a better way. And the way you do that is you, you elect the sheriff and put him in charge. That's that's the way it is. They, they will respond to the voters. Um, Can I respond to that? Sure. I, we actually agree with you out here. What's happened to our PRC in Berkeley um, was there was a Copley decision. It's or a, a court case, Copley versus San Diego in 2006, which was a which was a Supreme Court decision. Which basically secured the records of police complaints uh, and misconduct from public scrutiny. And what that has done is shield officers and made that forum one uh, that that doesn't have any power. So, uh, so I agree with you there. And also, this has also happened on a federal level with the Intelligence uh, Oversight Board, um, which after which oversaw um, several different, including the FBI, but several different uh, federal organizations. And after 9-11, uh, its powers were significantly eroded, and it was often basically ignored as well. So I, I agree. Deputy, do you have anything else? Yes, I do. In response to that, it mentions federal. It's okay. <laughs> this is all the more reason to get the sheriff in charge. They're not responsible to the Fed. Okay? Any Fed wants to come into whatever say that sheriff happens. Yeah, over here. Better check with the sheriff first. The sheriffs all need to know that. Okay, that's that guy up in Wyoming. Uh, the ones uh, over at... Uh, Dave, that's oh, Dave Mattis. Yeah. Uh, I got one more for you. Let me throw this out. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of a question. Does anybody... No, it's not. Let me ask you this other one first. Somebody said some, but we've got like 700,000 peace officers in the United States. This was... This was back away. Was that the number that was thrown out? Yes, I said that. Okay, I think you're wrong, sir. I don't believe we have 700,000 peace officers in the United States. I think we got about maybe a half a dozen. We may have close to 700,000 LEOs, law enforcement officers. But as far as peace officers go, I don't think so. Not anymore. We Here in Texas, you've got to be a peace officer to, to wear a badge, I believe. And you get a three-day, I think three-day, certification. My piece of paper means nothing. It's what's in the guy's heart that makes him what he is. I've had engineers working for me, the green engineers that could not balance their own check. Okay? That piece of paper means nothing is what you can do with it. All right, and you're starting to break you. up there, Deputy, so I'm going to let oh, you go fine. there. But we got the point in, and I appreciate the call very much. Thank you. I have a final okay. question that I want an answer to before we run out of time. It seems as if today... The smallest of crimes is treated with massive shows of force. Even children are handcuffed and sent to jail, court, or hospitals just for behaving like children. In the past, such behavior would have been accepted as normal. 
Why has crime fighting, why have crime fighting tactics become so severe in relation to the violation? Whatever happened to the principle of rehabilitation? It seems today like everything's about punishment. Well, I, I would, uh, this is the, the sheriff, I, I would uh, agree with uh, what Jack had said about that earlier and, and that we need to try to prevent things. And, you know, there's one thing you can't fix. You, you can't fix stupid. And the, some of the people that we have in office are simply stupid. And the zero tolerance policies at schools is actually what you were alluding to, Brent. And when you get somebody who um, uh, did, did hardly anything in school, I was trying to think of an, of an actual incident uh, where kids have been suspended or arrested at schools for the most innocuous things, and, and you're right. Sometimes it's just being a normal kid. And uh, when the schools uh, uh, and, and officers both um, overreact, it, it, it causes the entire uh, police community and the law enforcement community and the peace officer community to talk to the uh, deputy that just called. Um, it, it makes us lose respect from the community. And the thing I want the most from the community is respect. And we have got to get off the numbers game and get back into real service, and we need real leadership. And uh, we've lost uh, we've lost our way, and we have got to get back to the Constitution. We've got to get back to the very basics. We have to start over, and when you start over in America, you have to start with the foundation, and our foundation is the Constitution. In ten words or less, each of you, has the United States become a police state? Richard, uh, I'll say that in one word. Yes. Honey? If by police state we mean, uh, you know. Whatever uh, it means to you. Centralized uh, policing and intelligence-led policing, increasingly punitive technologies and practices and draconian laws, we would say yes. Jack? No, I don't agree with that um, because I've. I've uh, done a lot in history, and, and I've seen, studied police states, and I don't think we're there yet, but I think we're certainly on the way to that, and we could tip at any moment to that, and it's very, very frightening to me. Uh, also, Brent, going back to... All right, yeah, you, these, uh, are gonna be, these are going to be your okay, final comment. Final yeah. comments, about 30 seconds or so. Go ahead, Jack. Uh, well... Anybody out there that wants to change this stuff, please go to our website and become a member of LEAP. We have a credibility at LEAP. There's 50,000 of us, cops, judges, prosecutors, prison wardens, DEA, FBI, and, and supporters. Uh, anybody could join now. And we have a credibility nobody else has. When we talk about this stuff, we convince 80% of our audience, no matter where we go, if you want to change it, you're going to have to force the politicians to change it. And you need a very credible organization to, wish, to go to Washington and demand these changes. And it has to be a huge grassroots organization. We think it should be lead. Ani, final comment. Uh, yeah, we also believe that uh, in empowering the grassroots uh, aspect of contesting these practices and encourage people to start monitoring the police and start doing cop watch uh, in their own communities. Excellent. Sheriff Richard Mack, you'll have the final word. Closing comment. I just want to ask every peace officer and every public official, uh, if you swear an oath of office, if you swear an oath to uphold and defend the United States Constitution, you have an ethical and moral obligation to independently fulfill that oath. If you swear an oath, is it perjury to not keep that oath? And if you swear an oath to the Constitution, do you have a responsibility to read it, understand it, know it, and then understand the intent of the Founding Fathers? Uh, I, you know, I'm sorry to beat that dead horse, but that is where it's at. We are founded as a constitutional republic, and I believe peace officers in this country have got to know and understand that. And no apologies needed and uh, no apologies necessary at all. Thank you so much. My guests, thank you all of you. Ani Paradise of Berkeley Top Watch 
www.berkeleycopwatch.org. Jack Cole of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, www.leap.cc. And the inimitable, the ever-present Sheriff Richard Mack, www.sheriffmack.com. Thank you all for being a part of today's very important panel discussion on crime fighting. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure.